Um, Kathy O'Neill is director of the LEAD program in data practices at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and she's employed as data science consultant at Johnson's, Johnson Research Labs. She attended UC Berkeley as an undergraduate, earned a PhD in mathematics from Harvard, and afterward held positions in mathematics departments of MIT and Barnard College, doing research in arithmetic, algebraic, geometry. Yes. She's co-author of the book that was mentioned today already, Doing Data Science, Straight Talk from the Frontline. And also, very importantly, she's author of one of my personal favorite blogs, mathbabe.org. And if you don't look at it, you should. And here's Kathy. Thanks. Thank you. Oh my god. I don't know about you people, but I hate this room because I can't see people around here. And I mean, and I, I love the uh, organizers, don't get me wrong, but the room isn't very good for interaction. I'm a very interactive person. So please feel free to come sit at this chair over here or close by or, or motion to me because I don't like speaking by myself over here. I'm feeling lonely already. Don't make me cry. Okay, so I worked in arithmetic algebraic geometry. That was really pure mathematics. And then in 2006, for some ridiculous reason, which I might go into and you can ask me to go into, I decided to become a quant at a hedge fund exactly right before the credit crisis. Um, so I entered and got a front row seat at the dysfunction that was our financial system from 2007 to 2011. Um, and then I left in disgust. But I, by the way, just want to say I loved the data. Oh my God, I fell in love with data. It was very sexy. I loved the analysis. I loved feeling like I was learning stuff. I did love other aspects of finance. I'll bring, it, bring them up a little bit later because I do think we have lessons to learn from finance. Um, another thing I want to mention is that I think data science Big data, we've all complained about the rhetoric around that, and I'll, I'll, do, I'll do the same. Um, kind of started in finance, not really, it started in a lot of different places, but um, when people talk about big data and data science, I think, well, finance was the first data science. And other people might say, no, astrophysics was the first data science, and I would say, well, you know, a lot of astrophysicists became quants on hedge, uh, at, you know, hedge funds on Wall Street. There was basically no data science there was no analysis really of data on Wall Street until like the Black Shoals and stuff in like the 70s and the 80s and the bond market. So, and then all these scientists came to, to, to um, Wall Street and they started trying out different things from their different fields. And so it was like the first, I guess what I'm saying is the first interdisciplinary data-oriented science happened on, on Wall Street. Um, so that's one of the reasons I'm going to say we can learn lessons from finance because that failed spectacularly in certain ways. In other ways, it didn't. So after that, I left. I went to, I decided to like do something good for the world, so I went and worked as a data scientist. It took as much work as rewriting the, my title on my resume to get a job in um, an advertising startup tech company in New York City where I was analyzing um, the propensity to click on ads for people who you know, had Macs versus PCs. And by the way, people who have Macs have more money. Did anyone know that? Um, so after a few months of working in data science, I was like, holy crap, this stuff is really interesting and also kind of alarming in, in various ways. So I got kind of into thinking about it in a meta way rather than just doing my job. I wanted to think like, what is this? Is this a thing? To what extent is it a thing? Can we define it? That's where I wrote that book, Doing Data Science. It was an effort to try to describe the thing that is data science and whether it deserves its own field. Um, my conclusion is that it does, um, but we can argue about that. Um, and then I started also being kind of just like a, a skeptic, a data skeptic, which is actually a hard, a hard road to, to walk down if you work in New York City around a lots, lots and lots and lots of um, venture capital funding. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit, but just to make the point that um, there's, there's a lot of Kool-Aid being drunk around there. So guess who likes skeptics? Journalists. Journalists are actually kind of awesome in that way. They might actually go overboard and like negative news more than they should, but one thing that was cool about 
recently being hired by the journalism school at Columbia to start a data journalism program is that they were like totally embracing my skepticism for the first time. So that was kind of nice. So that was what I did this summer. I was the program director for a data journalism program that turned journalists into data journalists. That was the uh, attempt anyway. And I think we um, did a pretty good job. We had some amazing projects. We taught them Python. We taught them how to do data scraping. We taught them how to manipulate data. We taught them how to use algorithms. We did everything on the EC2 Amazon cloud. Um, we had instances out there. We made them bigger when we had bigger data. Um, so the way I tell my husband the, the summer went was the first half of the summer, we, we, we taught them to think of themselves as gods because they came in thinking that anyone who could do data analysis was a god. And the second half of the summer, we taught them that they weren't gods because the second half of the summer, we f focused instead on skills, we focused on other kinds of literacy. So I think of this functional literacy as like skills like can you do Python? Can you write a code? Will it work? Will you get an answer? Can you clean code? Can you put things in pandas data frames? The second half of the summer we thought about, well, what else could you have done? And how would that have changed the result? And we talked about to what extent are the default settings on Excel forcing you to think in a certain way? That was, um, it was a really great experience and I was um, happy to sort of not only teach a group of, of young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed journalists how to, how to do stuff, but how to think about stuff. And so that's one of the reasons I'm here, because I think that's an important part. So I was asked to come pitch a Yale um, Data Science Institute. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm also going to actually tell it, I'm first going to tell you why I think you should have one, although you already might know. But I'm going to tell you why I think you should have one. And I'm going to be very passionate about it, because that's what I do. And then I'm going to tell you like the ticky-tack details of stuff, because I interviewed a couple people over at IDSI, at Columbia Institute for Data Science and Engineering, which has had ups and downs. It was announced to exist by Bloomberg, I want to say three years ago, but it's something like two years ago. And it's, it's taken a while. And we'll, we'll talk about why that happened. So why? OK, here's the thing. When I went into um, the hedge fund, it was like really, really intense and proprietary, and I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone, including my own office mate, about what I was working on. I was working with Larry Summers on some, some project. I'll tell you guys now, but not after the talk. Um, just kidding. Uh, but we had one thing we did have in our group, which was the futures group, was like this kind of weekly seminar on on ways of thinking about modeling, um, run by my boss, Steve Strong, who is really, really a very good modeler. And he was a Bayesian. So we talked about um, prior beliefs and what were our priors. And just like the young woman who talked about the um, EPI score or EPO score or whatever it was, um, she talked about downweighting data that you are less certain of. We did that. We also downweighted data that was old. Um, that the, the extent to which we downweighted data on, you know, what was the half-life of a, of a piece of data? Like if it's a week old, is it old news or d it, does it depend on the market? Is it different in bonds than it is in commodities? So that kind of thing. That's the kind of conversation we'd have. And we called that lambda often. When we were downweighting old data, we had this kind of, we're, we didn't even take averages of things. We took... Um, you know, averages weighted by the, the sort of downweighting lambda variable. So that was called our, you know, lambda, and it was considered our belief in how much we lost interest in, in the data as it got older, as it became less certain. This is called a prior. This is called, I, I actually should have said, the, I should have said the overburdened lambda, because what I'm going to do here is I'm going to demonstrate that I then went into data science and I found two other ways of imagining the same parameter called lambda in a totally different context. But it was exactly the same thing. It was lambda. It was even called lambda. So there, there was some kind of like magical undercurrent of understanding that this is all the same thing. But I found in machine learning that people did, I think what's called ridge regression. And then there was another maybe a different part of computer science, that they did, they did L2 regression. Okay, those both had lambdas, 
and I don't remember which one was which, um, but they were, they were two different names for the same thing. And it, was, it, it ended up being in exactly the same usage as I, I would have used my belief lambda in a, in a regression, in just a simple multivariate regression. But it was thought of in a totally different way. So, so it was thought of, for the most part, so I'm going to skip ahead in, in one, for one slide for a moment and thought that you would use it as an a insurance that your algorithm would converge. So you had some kind of, you had some kind of, I think of it geometrically because I'm, I'm a geometer, but you have some kind of space and you're using some kind of Newton algorithm to try to find some minimum and you're like, you know you're going to find the minimum, but is it a global minimum or is it a local minimum? And you're like, well, if you tune lambda, if lambda's high enough, then it's forced to be convex, and then it's a global minimum. So whatever I just said, I, what I mean to say is lambda was used, the same lambda used as a way of ensuring that your algorithm would finish. It's called a convergence insurance, I call it. Then at the, it, the, some of the same people would turn around and they would say, well, that's... That's how we know we have convergence, but actually we use lambda to tune, our, to optimize our algorithm. So we, we sort of test our algorithm for different lambdas and we see which one gives us the most accurate result, and that's our lambda. So it's actually a hyperparameter that people use to tune their algorithms to optimize it for their results. Does that make sense? Same lambda. Now, I just want to make the point that this lambda, which was being tuned to optimize your results, was definitely not the same lambda we used at least in theory, to sort of state our belief. Because, you, you know, when you state your belief, you're not supposed to tune it afterwards. Um, <laughs> so I thought that was pretty interesting. Because I'm like, well, this is, it's always called lambda, but it's, it's really literally meaning three different things to three different fields coming into this, into this mishmash of space called data science. And I think we can learn from each other. So another example I came to, and I call these technical overlaps. This is the last one I'm, I'm sure of. It's a technical overlap, and it's an interesting one, and it's overburdening one poor little um, Greek letter. Um, but the second one, I'm not really sure of, but it's so fascinating to me. I was doing um, a talk. I went to Berkeley to give a talk, a math colloquium, and I, I gave a talk about recommendation engines because they were like, well, can you talk about something from data science because everyone in math wants to learn data science. So I was like, okay, I'll talk about recommendation engines. And one of the things I wrote about in my book is, I don't know if you guys heard the, about hunch.com. It's kind of a fun story. You go to hunch.com and, and, and you get asked 20 yes or no questions. And at the end of 20 questions, they know everything about you. And it's like really, really depressing because it means we only have 20 dimensions of interestingness like, you know, basically, chick flick or dick flick. You know, like, basically, that's with the first one. Are you a man or a woman? That, and then it gets, like, less interesting from there. But then, but then that defines you pretty much, pretty much accurately. After that, they tell you what kind of iPad you want or whatever. They tell you what phone you want, and, you, and they're right. It's really frustrating. So that's a recommendation engine um, that I learned about using alternating least squares. It's called the latent factor model. And then I was like looking around for other recommendation engines to show the mathematicians in Berkeley. And someone from Spotify, who's a friend of mine, um, told me, oh, you should use the ones we use. They come from this paper um, from Google, that Google News, if you guys know what Google News is. Um, <coughs> everyone knows what Google News is, but I don't think anybody uses it anymore. But anyway, so they actually used, there's, two, there's a couple, it's a really great paper actually, beautiful. But one of the things they use is a latent topic model. The other thing is a co-visitation model, which is also very sexy as a model, uses min hash. Um, but anyway, going back to the latent topic model, um, that, so the latent factor model, let me start at the latent factor. The first one requires you understand um, the sort of eigenvalues, eigenspaces of, of matrices. You sort of you rank, you sort of sort the eigenvalues in, in terms of size and you take the biggest ones, and those are the most important ones in terms of your variance. And so it basically depends on a factorization of matrices. So, but then at the end of the day, you choose a number of, um, a number of dimensions that you actually give it about. And if you're hunch.com, it's 20. And th then you're like, I give a shit about 20 things, and then I can infer the rest. Okay, so the first 20 dimensions of human 
nature are important, then everything else is trivial. It's just idiosyncratic, I should say. Um, then, okay, so then I looked into this paper, and I thought I understood the latent factor model pretty well. I looked into this paper, I found the latent topic model, which was, it had its own technical name, PLSI, which you can look up. And it was based on a statistical model with various assumptions about um, distributions and stuff. But at the end of the day, you chose 20, uh, you chose a number, could be 20, and then you did, and then you had the same number of variables as you had in the latent factor model. You, I could even tell you how many variables, like basically two very elongated rectangular matrices of size 20 and the number of people involved, or 20 and the number of items involved. So in the case of Spotify, you're, the items are songs and the people are people. And in the latent topic model, the items are news articles that you may not have read, you may have read, and the people are people. So you have these two really long matrices and this ch the choice of 20. And then you have some arithmetic to update this when you get new data. So in, in like the, they were presented in very different ways. They, they were optimizing to very different looking things. One of them was multiplicative, one of them was additive. But at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? I think these are the same algorithm. I just think that if you, if you make specific choices for um, for this distribution, like Gaussian or whatever, I think this will come down to the very same algorithm. And when I gave this talk in Berkeley, I just asked the audience, is this the same algorithm or not? And some guy who's a fifth year graduate student in statistics is like, yeah, that's the same algorithm. And he gave me a reference, but I couldn't understand it. So I'm not really sure it's true, but here's my point. My point is it's probably true, or if it's not exactly the same algorithm, it's really close, and it's coming from machine learning on the latent factor model, or even mathematics, I'm not exactly sure, versus statistics, pure up, up and straight, straight up statistics. And it's like, we should know this. We have these really large companies depending on these algorithms that are essentially the same thing, or, um, or, or if they're not, it's an interesting fact that we should be talking about, which no one is talking about. Okay, so I'm guess I'm, what I'm saying is that there is technical overlap in at least in industry, and I'm sure in academics as well, that uses different language, that uses different, even different assumptions, but but they're the same technical thing. And the fact that they came, they were, they people came upon them in totally different ways, is what makes them interesting. Okay, now I'm going to tell you why we could never do this. We can never. It's like get scared. Okay, it's never going to happen. I'll explain why. So I spent, as I told you, the summer working in journalism um, at the journalism school, and I was doing like a data journalism program for journalists, and I was t constantly talking to the computer science department because many of my students are now taking computer science classes. And basically, and I'm not going to, this is an exaggeration, and I apologize to anyone who gets offended by this, but everyone in journalism hated me, and everyone in the computer science department hated me. And I'm cool with that because I've got a thick skin, but there is a clash of cultures, and it's real. So let me explain what I mean. Journalism, and I'm just, I'm gonna, it's cartoonish what I'm saying, okay? But just, just there's an element of truth to what I'm about to say. And I'm, again, not saying it to offend, I'm saying it to clarify. But journalists care about the human story, human face on the story. What is, who is that person that, who's the victim? If it's, there's no victim, there's no story. And that's not always true, but in traditional journalism, it often is true. They think of the data person, generally speaking, as a service person, somebody who like does the infographic and like gets paid by the hour. <laughs> in computer science, you have the complementary blind spot, where you have people who are focused on fast, um, efficient algorithms, large scale, um, you have it's very macho. Um, you have to really understand like, you know, web protocols to even get coffee in the lounge. <laughs> um, and they're just like, why human messy stories, individual stories? Why? Who cares? Not relevant. So I, I, what I'm saying is like to try to to try to bring together even those two departments for the sake of this e emerging field of data journalism. It's not easy, but at the same time, well, 
So this is my obstacle slide, so I don't have to, I don't have to give you the good news yet. Um, let me give you another example, though. And this goes to um, a, a woman named Noemi Eladad, who's in bioinformatics at Columbia and is also heading the um, health center at the um, Institute for Data Science and Engineering at Columbia. So I interviewed her because now I have journalistic approaches to everything, which is fun. Um, so I interviewed her this week about this talk, and I said, so how's it going? Uh, it's he's three years old. How are things? And she was like, well, things are looking up. But at the beginning, it was really hard because there was this culture clash between bioinformatics and computer science. And I was like, well, tell me about it. And I don't want to make the inf- comp- CS guys bad guys, by the way. I love computer scientists. My parents are both computer scientists. But she was basically said a similar kind of thing. Um, she said, you know, the computer scientists are like, well, you know, th- at the beginning, not anymore, at the beginning, the computer scientist approach was we don't need to know the health stuff, the medicine. We know how to mine data. Just give us the data. Stop talking to us. Just give it to us. We will do it. And we will solve medicine. <laughs> And then the people um, in medicine were like, these guys don't know anything about the context. They don't understand missing values. They don't understand the bias. Um, They don't understand the difference between this population and that population. And I already know how to do my analysis. Leave me alone. So we have the same kind of complementary blind spot in the cultures um, and complementary values. So... It's a real thing, and that's within academia. So if, if you wanted, and I, I don't want to just have a data science institute at Yale for just academics. Like Theoretically, ideally, it would include people from industry, and it would include people from government who are doing civic data stuff and with open data and all that stuff. And we've heard that from them today as well. And we have that same problem there, is that you have this complete, you have the blind spots, um, and you, you value different things. Um, and and I don't I don't mean like I get paid for this I don't get paid for that I that's the next slide <laughs> this slide I mean you actually dismiss the other person's expertise so part of a data science institute is creating a community where you talk enough about what your actual actual problems of your analysis are until you have respect for that person's expertise because it is a question of respect. Um, and by the way, just to give away um, the ending of that story with Noemi, she told me that in the last year and a half, um, people have been writing large grants together from the medical school and the engineering school, and that through the grant writing process, and sometimes they got the grant, sometimes they didn't, but when they got the grants, especially starting to actually work together on these large-scale projects have given them an immense amount of mutual respect. So those initial problems are fading away, so they can be overcome. However, I'm gonna, uh, that doesn't keep me from having a second slide of, of obstacles. And by the way, again, raise your hands if you disagree with me or want to add something, because I like interaction. Um, I just want to make the point that I've been an academic, so I know what the problem, the actual limitations of an everyday life as an academic are, and that you're, you're incentivized to think on a daily, a daily basis of publishing papers, um, and getting funded, whereas if you're a policymaker you want to, or you know, somebody in government, you're you're actually trying to affect policy. So I worked to the um, I worked to the mayor's office under Bloomberg for six months in health and human services, working with um, homeless data. So I can talk about that, but like it's a very different approach to what you decide to talk about um, or what you avoid talking about. I think is a better way of approaching that. Um, to is when you're in, a, in when you're working in proprietary startup land, which I did um, for a few years, sometimes it's a marketing technique. You do it. Sometimes you are literally just the quant in the corner, as you know. Hey, we got quants. They're PhDs right there. Um, sometimes, so sometimes you just have to exist, and that's 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 not really data science. But other times, when you do do actual data science, what leaks out is um, is more about PR than than really about science. Um, and sometimes you, you actually are trying to inform the public, and we saw an example of that, again, with the environmental score, which was great. But I just want to make the point that all the people that I wish would come and be part of the Data Science Institute at Yale, or whatever you call it, um, they all have different metrics of success. So it's, it, it would, you'd have to find a way 
through, you know, however it gets funded or however people get brownie points or however people get what they want, you have to figure out a way for everyone to have a reason to be there. And, and of course, part of it would be that they, they learned how to uh, do better science. So here's the thing. The really urgent reason we need this is because there is no, nobody doing it quite like you could do it here. You guys have Yale Law School, which is an incredible place. Um, they already have something called the Internet and Society Center. Um, so they're already talking about ethics and standards um, for, da for, for doing data in, in industry, but it could be a wider discussion as well. We have an incredible amount of complexity going on. It's, it's almost impossible for non-data experts to understand what's actually happening in Google or Facebook, um, and it affects policy. So I went, to, um, a, I went to a House subcommittee meeting on big data and analytics about a year ago, and I was really unimpressed with um, the people that were talking there and their, their approach to explaining how big data was important and how everybody doesn't mind their privacy violations. And it was staffed by the head of research at IBM um, and other um, industry representatives. So it was, it's just a lopsided discussion here. I'm not saying those people don't deserve to talk. I'm just saying that what the policymakers are hearing is incredibly biased towards commercial interests. And that doesn't have to be true. Um, I'll just say that again. <laughs> Commercial interests. This man said that privacy is dead, and like he shouldn't have the last word on that. He has too much money coming in to think otherwise. So we should have some people thinking about data in a critical way that don't get rich off of it. Don't get rich off of um, uh, obscuring what's actually going on. I also wanted to, if I'm not radical enough yet, let me just say, um, I really think we could take some lessons from the financial crisis. The way I look at the financial crisis, as I said, the finance was the, was big data, was data science before, um, before data science was a term. And one of the things they made up, uh, there's a lot of ways you can think about the financial crisis, but one way you can think about it is that it was a siloed mistake, that we had different characters who were aware or semi-aware of bad things happening in the mortgage market. But we, in particular, well, but not nobody was aware of everything. That's one of the problems, unless, unless there were people who were aware of everything, in, in, case, in which case, those people. But most people were just aware that what they were doing locally was kind of sketchy, but they were making a lot of money off of it. And they didn't, they didn't think, they didn't have to think um, in a lo more global sense. So it was a question of siloed information, and in particular, and the most massive silo was between finance, Wall Street and the regulators. And that's a mistake, I think, that cost the, 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 the people of this, the taxpayers, the, the people who lost their homes, et cetera, that was, a, is a, that was the repercussions for that. So I guess what I'm saying is, I think what we can do when it comes to big data, data science, is we can make better science, but we can also make sure that we are not like screwing the average person with the big data models that we already have by keeping in touch with who's actually working on the data and keeping in touch with regulators and policymakers about what that actually looks like and what the real risks are. And I have seen progress on this front. One of the most um, impressive things I've seen lately is Obama's big data report um, with Podesta, who went around the country and talked to people about various civil rights um, violations that are potentially happening with big data. So uh, great to see that, but it's like just one report, and we should have an institute devoted to that. Or not only to that, but that should be one of the things that, so where is that conversation gonna happen? I mean, that's another way of looking at it. It's not gonna happen at Facebook. Facebook is spending millions of dollars lobbying against the European privacy laws. It's not gonna happen it's gonna happen in an institution, but it has to be an institution that has enough actual information about the way data is used that they can have an informed discussion. So I, I feel like an institute, maybe in the uh, center to the law center, but maybe here, um, I mean, maybe at the Yale Data Insti um, Institute could invite policymakers. Well, I'll get, I'll get to that in a second. 
So what would a data science institute look like? So what are the, I, I'm, I'm kind of a party planner, so the first thing I think about is parties with um, wine, but we could have a colloquium first. Um, <laughs> it has to be a community, is what I'm saying. You, it's, it, the way you get people to figure out, I use Lambda for tuning parameter. Oh, I use a Lambda for that. You know, the way you do that is you get people to talk to each other, and the way you get people to talk to each other is you, you get them together in the same physical location, and you talk about your research. Um, and you also you also share food and wine, and you promote cross disciplinary research with um, support um, from grants. Um, from you know we we've seen today a lot of a lot of potential re, um, support for this kind of thing. So that's awesome. You need a place a space to work in. So the Columbia um, ITC has like they're building out space in the northwest corner of the of campus. Um, t right now, they don't have space, so it's not absolutely critical for if, as long as you get to like rent rooms and stuff at, in, on your campus. Theoretically, ideally, you'd have conferences devoted to the stuff, um, you know, with really good speakers that know how to cross disciplinary lines and know how to like think a little bit higher level about what works and what doesn't work in their field, like a, a kind of a um, what are those words, the survey papers, but survey survey talks, I would love to see that, about data, like um, data management and data analytics in a given field. And again, I think workshops for policymakers, because the policymakers are, are not actually bad people, they're just really busy and don't have any details at all. So the lobbyists tell them what to think, because that's what lobbyists do, but lobbyists are, you should think about it this way, lobbyists are performing a function that other people could perform, which is giving them information that they want to hear. They love to hear information from people who are academic and trustworthy. <coughs> or they might not come themselves, but they'll send their aides, and, and congressmen's aides are really smart. Um, I think there's a huge need for educational initiatives, which a data science institute would provide that would be probably the easiest thing to set up actually is setting up you know masters and phd programs um at least the very the first semester you could you could hire some people to teach graduate classes i actually think that um this concept of numerical and computational literacy should be at the core of the curriculum and for undergraduates the stuff i did with my journalism students this summer i could have done with freshmen at college and it would have helped them it would have helped them in a lot of ways so I don't see why 18-year-olds aren't doing that, and I don't see why Data Science Institute wouldn't um, wouldn't take the initiative on that, and it would be a really popular popular class, I would expect. I also think that, you know, I, I, you heard me talk about this um, interaction with the public. The public is at uh, is a stakeholder here, and I think the stake the the some of the public really wants to understand this stuff, and where are they going to go for that? So it's not just about your, the undergraduates, although I know this is a very undergraduate-focused campus, um, which is great. I also think that the general public should we should have like um, information for the general public on how, you know, what is it, you know, what does Facebook actually know about you, and what are they allowed to do with that? That something you could Google for, but it would be a lot more um, interesting and effective if we had like really good speakers explaining that. I think the, um, a data science institute would ideally provide resources to ac the academic researchers, so this would be another reason for them to want to be part of it. Computing infrastructure, we talked a lot about today. Um, we have basically ad hoc solutions to computing problems in every department, if not every research lab, and the question of how to think about that in a more holistic sense and like how to solve that problem um, probably save money overall. I don't know how the, the actual funding would work with that. <coughs> you need a few staff to organize the colloquium and the wine. Um, I said you need space, you need money. I mean, ideally you'd have, so um, Columbia started out with $50 million, um, although that was all fake in various ways. Um, I think in, in the following sense that um, they, they didn't actually get any money from Bloomberg, they just got like a decrease on their sewer taxes for like 15 years until it was worth $50 million or something. 
Um, so it, it's kind of a weird situation. But I, the, the point is that you can hire people for the institute. Um, and you could do it one of two ways. You could hire people for the institute, like you could hire a person be part of our institute. Or you could hire someone in electrical engineering or in computer science or in um, biometric, uh, bioinformatic research, and then it'd be joint with the institute. That's the model they use at Columbia. And then, just for people who are interested, I also found out that they, when they have grants coming in, some percentage of it gets siphoned off into the um, institute. So that's how it's all about the money. I know that. Um, also, the way they do it in at um, at ITSI is they have um, outside partners so they they have like partnerships contracts that they've now they've now um, firmed up where they have like certain things they offer larger companies like IBM or GE or Accenture and they have different kinds of contracts for startups because startups want different things than big companies do and they also offer different things so big companies offer money they want things like expertise in a certain general area and education in that area. So they might send some people from IBM to Columbia to learn about this kind of field. Um, and startups um, want to take students to get um, internships, and they want to be able to call someone up and ask them a very specific machine learning question, which is a very different kind of ask. Anyway, so but establishing those kinds of partners would be an important part of an um, institute for data science. Um, and you know it's a different ecosystem in New Haven than it is in New York City. I realize that, but I, I think there are partners. It just might be more on the side of policy, or a different a different um, industry than than exactly the same thing in, in New York. So this is where I get to the part where I don't really have opinions, but I do think these are important questions to ask. Um, so how would you actually set this up? Like who would it even be included in this? I mean. From my experience in journalism and um, data science and mathematics, I, I, I'm getting more and more to the point where I think a broad definition is good. Like you do want people from all sorts of departments that are interested in this. Now at the same time, you probably don't wanna just get everyone in the room and say, hey, what do we do? You wanna have like some projects in mind or you might have themes, you might have like, for these two years, here's what we're gonna do. Like here's an idea, for, th for three years we're gonna focus on people who actually analyze the data and how do we analyze the data, how do we collect our data and how do we manage our data. And then the next three years, like we can talk with people who don't analyze the data but we, they do interact with the results of our analysis. Like not, not the medical researchers but the doctors who use the results of our analysis and that would be a different project. And the three years after that, you might wanna interact with, um, you wanna, bring in people who are impacted by your analysis. Because there's all sorts of different ways of thinking about data science and how it interacts with the world. And of course, you could th be thoughtful and set up your data inside institute to be itself data driven. So you could see what works and what doesn't and what, ins what inspires people and what brings in grants and what actually seems to, in a long term sense, um, create um, good research. So a couple lessons I got from Chris Wiggins before I left. Any kind of, and he's on the executive board of ITSE. He's also on the education board and on the entrepreneurial board. So he set up partnerships with, on, with the startups. Um, any kind of mission that you create, mission attached to a data science institute has to be novel. Has to, there has to be something you offer that you don't see at Cornell, um, the, the new Cornell Tech or you, NYU, which also has a new thing or it's a, um, it has to be coherent, it has to be doable, I didn't write that down, but it has to be doable. Um, and, as, and there's an inverse relationship between size and velocity, so one of the reasons at the end that ITSE took three years to start making progress is because they started out massive. Their first um, campaign was to hire 75 faculty. So that, you know, it, it's, if you try to do boil the ocean, it takes a while. So I don't know, what that means, it might, it, all it means is you have to be patient depending on how big you wanna be. Also, obviously, there has to be a good incentive structure in place. As I think I might have said, the funding for ITSE went into the engineering school, and all the schools are siloed in terms of their money, so there's the arts and sciences, there's the medical school, and, you ha and they had to think pretty hard about how to get medical researchers interested in doing this, and it, it's about money. 
And finally, I just want to make the point that, well, earlier from one of the speakers, we um, heard this idea that, that when the data from different fields sits next to each other, we will magically find connections. I don't think that's true. Going back to my original examples, people use different vocabulary, even if they've come to the same mathematical or analytical approach, they use different words. I was thinking once of um, building a huge network of mathematics papers, like connected, in directed graph, like this one was referenced by that one, and this is referenced by that one, or maybe not um, just explicit references, it would be even better if I just said topics. These are related because they have some of the same, using natural language processing to say these are the related to each other in topic. And then I realized that that wouldn't actually get me where I wanted to go because what I really want to go is I want to say when are two math, two math papers related in ideas? That's not the same thing as words. And that's the, what we've learned is that people who come at the same ideas but they have totally different vocabulary. That's not going to happen through a machine learning algorithm. That's only going to happen through a community. So the connectors, so, Ella, so Noemi told me that in the last three years, she's, she's become the connector between the medical school and the computer science department. She knows everyone there. She knows what they do. And when someone needs to know who can I talk to that does this, she knows who to go to them to go to. So you need connectors. So I just want to thank Chris Wiggins and Noemi for my interviewing um, them with annoying questions, and I'd love to take questions. Thanks. So we will have a respondent first and then oh. take questions if we could. So uh, let me introduce to you Steve Gervin. Steve is the Deputy Provost for Science and Technology, as well as the Eugene Higgins Professor of Physics and Applied Physics. His academic research is in theoretical quantum physics. His portfolio includes a long list of things, including central campus science departments, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and collaboration on science strategy with the School of Medicine, and a good partner for me in working in high-performance computing. Steve? Uh, well, thank you, Kathy, for uh, <clears throat> making an interesting case for um, for a data science institute. Uh, let me start by saying I've met a large set of mathematicians and a large set of people persons and until today the intersection was a null set. Um, so I'm pleased to, pleased to meet you. Um, so you've, I mean, I was struck by sort of the, the one slide where you used the word urgent um, uh, about ethics, standards, policy, and complexity, and, and perhaps universities are the last place standing that can try to sit down and think about some of these important topics and in a way that's um, as unbiased as possible. It's certainly true that we're the last bastion for basic curiosity driven research that has no apparent, like most basic research, no apparent applications and yet decade after decade uh, surprising applications do appear often on a rather long time scale uh, inconsistent with um, corporate budgeting and federal annual budgeting processes. Uh, and of course a place like Yale that has very strong humanities and uh, 12 prof uh, professional schools and excellent law school as you mentioned um, is a place that can think about some of the implications for the human race for some of these uh, amazing tools that the scientists and engineers and uh, entrepreneurs are creating and unleashing on us. Um, and I, one of my hopes is that um, we can find a way to, to bridge the gap between the humanities and the sciences and engineering uh, with this stupendous gap 
Uh, and there we are programs in digital humanities and there's some humanists beginning to think about statistics of use of words in different books and so forth on uh, ancient texts. Um, and we have a computing in the arts program, but we still have a, you know, a tremendous gulf. I mean, when we, we had a Yale College faculty meeting about great inflation and an economist gave a brilliant committee report saying um, that, you know, when you have inflation in economics, you've changed the currency. And so let's switch from a letter grade system to a numerical grade system and people won't be able to exactly map between them and it'll be fine. And, and the human, humanist responded that I, I don't treat my students as numbers. So that we have a <laughs> we have a lot of work to to get the whole Yale community interested in uh, statistics and numbers. Um, so I think um, I had some slides, but I, I don't need to show them. I, my last slide, I, a few slides about the data that's pouring into Yale, um, uh, brought to you by the evil side of Moore's Law, namely the automated machines that can generate the data faster and faster in the huge uh, telescopes and the genome sequencing center that does a human exome every eight minutes uh, and so forth. But we are, my, my final slide was on a topic sort of related to your um, proposal here, which is we, we have under discussion, active discussion, the creation of a, a Yale Center for Research Computing or Computational Science, which could have uh, a big overlap with uh, the proposal you're making. And we have an eye on some space. and. Uh, even has an auditorium in it, uh, and we're thinking about a colloquium series and getting people together uh, to talk is, is, and learn about each other's um, research problems and finding commonalities or stealing tricks that people have learned from other fields uh, is an incredibly important activity in such things. So uh, I think I have more... Uh, just that bit of commentary rather than questions for you, and let's let the audience ask the questions. Thank you again. Uh, it's more, this is more of a suggestion than a question, but uh, it seems to me that several people, including Kathy, have commented on one of the ways to bring multiple disciplines to the same table and get them to start struggling with communication is to have a junior faculty member or a fellow who's trying to do a project that's at the interface between those two groups. I would say another way of doing that, not competing but a complementary way, is to try to be, to have teams trying to solve a problem together uh, and comparing and contrasting the approaches they might use from the disciplines that they were trained in. Uh, because then all that language issue begins to be quite apparent, but also you begin to understand how the mapping works between those two different, two or three or four dif different disciplines. So I, I really uh, liked your going through all the um, elements we need for data science institute here. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, but one element I was thinking about is one of the things we really need for data science is we need data. And what data would we work on in this data science institute? I mean, where would that data come from? Because, you know, I hear all the time about all these interesting things that Google and Facebook are doing or you know, that all the wizards on Wall Street are doing, but I, I don't know where to get that data. And, you know, I, I think where, where do we get data to do interesting things in data science? Well, there's two ways of thinking about that. It's a great question. Um, one of them is that the people who are involved in your, in your center would already have data because they already have projects. But another answer is I think you get it from Facebook. No, because, I mean, Facebook has a terrible PR problem right now because they're so proprietary and they're doing relatively um, questionable ac activities. And I think if you said, you know, a, like a public call for, for examining certain things about the way they act, I think they would probably give it to you because they'd want to clear their name. 
I mean, I think, I think that's the kind of thing you should do if you had an institute. You should be challenging Facebook to show that they're not doing something that's wrong. library of data, so to speak, I mean, and also an understanding of where and how one goes about getting that data, whether you're talking about EMR data or Facebook data or, I mean, it's, you learn from each other about how to break through the barriers, I think. I, I, thank you. I mean, and I think the librarians here have already explained that they, they want to help curate that library of data. I also wanted to mention that I didn't put into my slide deck that um, an institute like this would not only give us a way of collecting data, but probably an opportunity to build tools for research that don't exist but should, that would promote um, the kind of collaboration that would be useful in an institute. So I'm, again, that, that's something that would be novel. I don't think that's happening anywhere else. Um, for the most part, most of the other um, institutes that I know of are in some sense like vehicles for NIH and NSF grants <laughs> more than places where they're actually building tools. So I, I like to say that I couldn't have done my data journalism program without the IPython notebook. It's a tool which is minimal. It's, it's got to get better. It will get better. But it's a, it's a great tool. And so it's the first step towards something that we could make that's really excellent, that would make research interactive and collaborative. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, in regards to partnership with external organizations, I think that's key to really making such a department a success because to your earlier point, you really need that practical or that real life data to analyze to, to really understand um, how things will work in the, the real world, so to speak. Um, my background is in baskets and supermarket retail analytics and it's very hard to practice sort of data mining on those millions and billions of rows of data without actually using the actual basket data that has come from a, you know, a, a retailer. So I think um, having those partnerships is really key to, to making such a, uh, an enterprise a success. Yeah, I'd like to throw in that if you make the Data Science Institute to some extent kind of like a consultancy, that's what consultants do. That's the model of consultancy, which is that you, you get paid to do jobs. You don't own well, the, the question of IP should be separate, but you, you basically learn on the job how to do certain things and, and, and then you know how to do them. And then you can even build your own product to solve that problem once and for all, once you've done this, the same. But in any case, that's another way you could learn, not only learn techniques, but also get access to data. Yeah, I did want to throw in that I, I really think that the law school is just such an incredible resource because at the very least we were talking last night um, about the, um, the medical records um, and I think it was Eben Moglen and his group that um, sued to get the VA open sourced, like the VA system of medical record keeping open sourced and like, um, I mean, so in other words, lawyers are a partner in in doing this the right way and at the very least to have them on your side so you can threaten to sue if people do something wrong or to get FOIA requests which is Freedom of Information Act requests which is a trick I learned in journalism school. Um, yeah, uh, the if you were to have a data science institute the thing I would want from them would be I guess maybe the consultancy aspect to be able to come in and say, I have data, I need to know how to archive it and curate it and make it accessible to others. Can you people help me? Is that, I didn't, I'm not sure I really saw that on your slides. Is that part of what you see as being the function of that kind of institute? Well, certainly it's, um, some basic education in that arena would be part of the educational initiative. I mean, part of it, any education in data science would be that kind of thing. But in terms of whether there would be actually a service where you can, I think that's what the librarians already are. But I don't know that that's enough. Well, th but they're going to up their game, so it's cool. <laughs> okay. Um, I, have a, I have a question 
on uh, on the potential for collaboration between uh, academics and industry when it comes to things like IRB, um, especially you mentioned the Facebook studies that have been very controversial. And something that I'd been thinking about is what if tech industry set up its own IRB? Um, and it seems like what you talked about, some of the unique things that Yale has when it comes to interaction with policymakers might allow it to influence or talk about best practices um, in a way that you know there's either a board that's set up or just guidelines that are created in this data science center. Um, so just to get your thoughts about something like that and what role Yale, Yale could play. Well, I absolutely agree with you that that's another great um, example of how perfectly situated are for that kind of thing. The current state, of course, is that people opt into the rules on Facebook or OkCupid, and then there is no IRB to to board to pass. Um, the conversation has like evolved recently because of the I don't know if you guys have looked at the OkCupid data scientists book called Dataclism. He's gone on like NPR a bunch of times, like laughing in the face of the concept of opting in. He's like, nobody reads that, nobody understands that. Um, he's you know playing a dangerous game, which I'm enjoying because I feel like at some point policymakers are going to have to say, actually, no one understands that, and nobody reads that, and it's insufficient. Maybe that's but that's the conversation a data science institute should hold with the public and with policymakers. That is absolutely. And by the way. Policymakers can't hold that conversation by themselves because they don't understand data enough. So I just wanted to, to say one more thing is, so first of all, it was really great that you mentioned the LISP, which is actually called the Information Society Program, and really, I think, is frankly thinking a lot about these data science issues. And I just I wanted to, to just follow up a little bit on the question I asked previously about where the data is going to come from. I, what I see in academia is there's this interesting dynamic where there's a tremendous amount of biological data and also data from, say, astronomy and natural sciences. But most of the driving force in data science is the people in the commercial world, you know, hiring these people in the financial world or the retail world, advertising and so forth. And whereas we, we can't actually study that data because it's all locked up and proprietary. And I was wondering if there's some way of thinking about how to train students on available natural sciences data, but sort of make them valuable for that commercial world. Because it seems that's what ends up happening. I mean, I think Phil Bourne kind of pointed this out too with the Google bus type of thing, and how to think about that process. Well, you know, I certainly think that um, the education initiatives I, I was talking about, in, in my mind, do, do that, that they fulfill the role of setting up students to be useful um, for a job like Google. And having said that, Google is like its own universe. And um, you know, the statisticians at Google don't even work with raw data anymore because they have such an amazing infrastructure. They only use higher level languages, um, like R. Um, so it's, it's kind of weird. I mean, and then you have other things like startups that do things like scrape the web and have completely unstructured data. Um, I guess what I'm saying is it's just so varied. It's hard. It would be hard to pre to prepare students for everything. So, um, but I do want to just. I guess it's a great moment to go back to earlier today when I heard some. Maybe it was you talking about Stata versus R. Like I, one of the things that you do have to be, you just have to be scrappy when you work in data science, right? So you just. I learned SQL over two days because that I needed to do something with a SQL database. You just have to learn everything. And you have to just get used to the fact that whatever you've gotten really good at is going to be old hat in a year, which is one of the reasons like when I see people talking about Hadoop, 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 I'm like, that's not, that's not what I'm going to be using next time I get a job in industry. I don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be on the grid. It's going to have aspects of Hadoop. It's going to be parallel. It's going to be fast. It's going to heat up the world's water. But it's not necessarily going to be called Hadoop anymore. Excuse me. My, uh, my understanding is that, the, uh, and I, I have a question on that uh, for you. So my understanding is that the main problem in data science, in speci specifically in academia, is not, neither the data nor, nor the algorithm. So we have frequent, a lot of different very good data sets, and they can be used in one or another way. 
And uh, we have a lot of different algorithms, and the real potential of them remain mainly untapped. So I think the most important problem is, as you put it very well, is a kind of subject matter experts in between of different domains and disciplines. Like in medicine, between uh, medical studies and computation. And, and well, in computation, between compu uh, those who do computation and now about algorithms and software engineers who can help to create a build and, uh, and a build up a more sophisticated and you know combined set of algorithms instead of just a few line of algorithm to do one task. Yeah, so I'm just gonna make a really short pitch for my book called Doing Data Science, which just not because I get the commission, although I do, um, but because it the first chapter or two, I think, we talk about building a data science team. And it's crucial, in fact, that you, you don't, first of all, you don't think of it as a project. It's usually you're building up a, a code base and you have layers of models. You know, you have this model will tell you whether they click, this one model will tell you whether they buy, this model will tell you whether, this other model will take those two models and to, to decide whether they're, they're clicking and going away and not coming back and buying, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and in order to do that, in order to assemble a team, you, f you find people who are good at different things. You have a domain expert, you have somebody who's good at communicating with the business people, you have, you have someone who's good at algorithms, you have someone who's good at coding, you have someone who's good at making it fast, you have someone who's good at collecting the data overnight that you need. And so it's a team effort in a way that I'm not sure it's, it's thought of the same way in research, but maybe it is, depending on the field. Thank you guys.